This is McKinsey Recruiting, a podcast created to help you learn more about McKinsey and company. My name is Philip, and together with Sydney, our other podcast host, I'm here to answer all your questions about McKinsey Recruiting and introduce you to some of our McKinsey personalities. In this episode, we will talk about something that is especially important for us, our inclusive culture. Our guest today is Julia, a partner in our Frankfurt office who joined our firm in 2004. Julia will share why she cares deeply about diverse team settings and equal opportunities, why feedback is so important to her and how all this relates to her degree in neurosciences. Are you ready? Then let's start our podcast, McKinsey Recruiting. Hi, Julia. Great to have you on board of our McKinsey Recruiting Podcast and a warm welcome from my living room in Cologne to your home office in Frankfurt. Thank you very much, Philip. It's an utmost pleasure to be with you today. Julia, I know that one of your favorite topics is nudging. That means small thought-provoking impulses to influence behavior without relying on prohibitions or rules. Wow, you said How? it perfectly. I'm impressed, Philip. You did your pre-work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, Julia, how would you recommend I begin our interview to apply these techniques correctly? <laughs> <laughs> You're already, well, one, one nudge can definitely be, um, be around empathy and around building connections. So by just alluding to the fact that we both are in our home offices, you in your living room and I'm in, in mine was already a quite, quite a good one to get us, to get us started. Okay. And, and as you said, huh, those are just little prompts that make it more likely for a certain behavior to, to get displayed. So the, the theory assumes that um, if there's motivation, so basically you're not against this behavior, right? There's, not, there's nothing that would actually prevent me from being friendly to you because I actually like you and enjoy working, working with you. And I also have the Thank capability. You, that, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> and I also have the general uh, capability to be friendly, right? That's the other, uh, the other important, <laughs> important hurdle we have to cross. So if there's motivation and there's uh, capability, those little props, those nuts, can make it just much more likely for behavior that is not unwanted to, to occur. Yeah. So we had a good start. <laughs> well done. Okay, so uh, something else. In my podcast research and by talking to some of your colleagues, I discovered that gratitude is extremely important um, to you. How do you incorporate this into your daily life? Um, I've even heard that you send uh, feedback voice messages to your teams. <laughs> Yeah, those those are two different things. So sometimes these voice messages can also be not so grateful. But let's let's start with a with a gratitude piece. No, 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 no. They they mostly are. I'm a I'm a, I'm a big big believer in strength based feedback, and I think that you can motivate uh, people, in particular colleagues that we're having here around in McKinsey, um, even more so if you build on their strength. So um, yeah, jokes aside, this those voice messages are are indeed rather rather encouraging than anything else. So yes, I'm I'm a strong believer in in in, in gratitude and in particular in building it into your day-to-day -day life. So the simple word of of thank mm -hmm. you or the little unexpected note, the the little act of kindness that was rather random is something that's very easy to do but can mean the world for for other people around you. And the nice thing about saying thank you is that it makes Both people feel better, <laughs> the one that receives it and the one that gives it. So yes, I, I purposefully built this in, in, my, in my day. That's my also day. something very McKinsey um, typical. So we always say that we have a culture of feedback. Um, however, I've heard also you prefer something called uh, feed forward. Um, can you explain what this is all about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's... Um, Uh, basically, when when you when you see someone behaving in certain ways, etc., and they ask you, "Hey, can you give me some feedback?" The thing I say, "Yes, of course, I can share with you what I've observed and the effect it had, mm -hmm. etc." But what I much more enjoy is, so what is it we're going to do with it jointly in the in the future? Because uh, the past is the past, so you cannot really change it. So I always encourage mm -hmm. my teams to obviously thoughtfully look back and see what worked, what hasn't worked, what they would do differently going forward, and and just asking around what effects the behavior has had on on the people on the people around them, be it their own team or be it a, a client session. But then most importantly, I, I love this both immediate outlook into the future and say so like, okay, 
So starting tomorrow, mm -hmm. what is it that we're going to do differently? And um, what the people you might have spoken to uh, might, might have wanted to also also share is that I I deeply enjoy thinking through with people also their 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 future, their big next steps into the career. Literally, what it is that they want to create, what it is that they want to build while they're within within McKinsey, and I enjoy these coaching conversations deeply and sometimes give them also unsolicitedly. <laughs> I can give you positive feedback at the moment. So uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll be talking um, about one topic today, which is diversity. Yeah. And um, you are McKinsey's leader for our All In initiative, which engages colleagues around the world to develop and share innovative ways of working that advance inclusivity. Um, could you explain your role and the topics you are dealing with? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, as you know, I'm a, I'm a partner with with McKinsey and, and Company, and I carry also another hat, which is the head of being the global partner lead for all mm -hmm. of our all in efforts. And indeed, those are all the efforts of McKinsey, in particular related to gender diversity and inclusion. And in this role, I'm responsible for basically the designing of all our inclusion and diversity programs. That's one thing. And also the, the smaller interventions where we talked about nudges at the start. I think they're equally important thinking through how to make a team room experience more inclusive, thinking mm -hmm. through how a recruiting process, an interview process, an onboarding process can be made more inclusive. So in addition to the big programs around sponsorship, around structurally supporting those primary caregivers that return, for example, from a longer leave and need to revamp mm -hmm. into their into their client service, et cetera, et cetera. So in addition to these very structural um, programs, I also work a lot on these behavioral behavioral interventions. Mm -hmm. um, wh what role plays mentorship and supporting others in that? A very strong one. And over the years, I've actually almost abandoned the word mentorship and tried to replace it with sponsorship whenever possible. I tell you why. Um, What's you the might difference? Have, <laughs> uh, you, you might have already heard quite a bit that women tend to get, and it might be true for all talent, tend to get over-mentored, but under-sponsored. So what does this mean? Um, a mentor is someone who gives you good advice when you ask for it, right? It's someone who sits down for a coffee with you, who tells you about their career, what they have done, how they would behave if they were in your shoes. And that's something that can be truly helpful, but it's not enough. What, what you need, and that's why I say we've developed quite a rigid approach to sponsorship in McKinsey, is you also need this very person that does not only provide the coffee, but that then mm -hmm. also provides the client opportunity, that provides the opportunity for you to speak at a conference, for you to present in a meeting, for you to be the one to share back the latest numbers that you've just received coming out of your analysis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a sponsor creates opportunities and ensures that you can shine in them when they when they emerge. Okay, I see. Uh, someone who really um, helps you with concrete um, with concrete opportunities in the end. Yes, and takes a risk on you and says, you know, I have your back. We'll get through this together. I'll show you something that you can do. Why don't you want to? So exactly, exactly. And that goes beyond mentorship. I think it, it, it can still be helpful to also have mentors and get a diverse set of opinions. Um, but in order to progress, you do need a um, good hand of sponsors. And uh, can you explain me um, back coming to um, the All In initiative? Why does McKinsey have such an initiative, and or why does it need it such an initiative? Mm. You might have seen um, a lot of the work that we've published externally, or started with Women Matter, it went into Diversity Matters. So very, very early on, more than a decade ago, we actually described the business case for diversity and even more so now inclusion. Uh, so, of course, we said if this is something that we in our own research with leading companies have found, we have to take our own medicine and also mm -hmm. apply those very principles that we've identified as being essential for the progress of you know, gender diversity inclusion to our own firm. Okay, um, we're going to come back to the topic uh, Women Matter and what it means for the economy yeah. um, a, a bit later. Um, but um, can you give me an example of McKinsey's inclusive 
culture, especially when it comes to different perspectives and backgrounds. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's there's one thing which I find um, remarkable amongst the, the the many others I could name now, which is that this um, obligation we call it even the obligation to dissent is so close to our hearts and even values in the firm. Um, what does it mean? Is that we believe that it is not enough to have um, the right mind, the right intellect in the room. This intellect also needs to speak up at the right moment, irrespective of hierarchy, seniority, etc. So we do not only say, you business analysts who have just joined the team may mm -hmm. in certain instances articulate your opinion. No, we actually say it is your very obligation from day one that when you find that there's something being said in the room that might not mirror what you found in your data, that might not fit with what you think is right, and you better have some facts and, and figures behind it, but what you what you think is is not is not right, you are obliged to speak up. So it's not just a right, it's an obligation to this. Exactly so, exactly so. Okay, um, thank you um, for that. Um, let's get to your uh, career because um, you completed um, a PhD degree in cognitive neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research and were awarded with a research scholarship and electives at Harvard Medical School and the World Health Organization. Since your degree, you have lived and worked in many places around the world, for example, also a longer period in the Middle East, so you seem like quite uh, the global citizen. Um, if you reflect back to the time when you were studying in Germany compared to the path that brought you um, to where you are today, is this the path that you imagined your career to go, um, especially when you're coming from a medical background and now work at a consultancy? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good question question and it's also a leading question the, the obvious answer is, is no when I studied medicine I thought I'd become a, a physician I, I realized quite early on though in uh, my studies that I was somehow asking different questions sounds a bit funny but but different questions that my classmates so I got very early then interested in the human brain the inner workings how do we make um decision what is real what do we perceive what do we versus what do we imagine etc so i got very early on interested in 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 other fields but pure um curative um medicine and then what what happened is um mckinsey was doing a study in germany to help the educational system get get better and the way that mm -hmm. they did it at we did it at the time um, was that we invited leading thinkers from very different disciplines to come together for workshops and express what they from their discipline would add give to the educational system so there were philosophers historians and there were brain research uh, researchers so at the time the professor i was working with actually took me along and It had been a really thought, uh, I still remember the evening, had been a really thought-provoking um, evening for me. And um, it was the time where I for the first time met McKinsey and McKinsey had been very good and then staying in touch with me afterwards. And I think what made the difference is that, um, in fact, it was a, um, a woman, a female partner working working for the McKinsey at the time who took a bit care of me over the years and always checked in. And one, one day she sat down with me for, for coffee and she said, you know, Julia, when you think about what you're doing in life, how big is your radius of impact? And I said, pardon me, <laughs> what's a radius of impact? Yeah. No, but, but, but basically what's your radius? And she repeated it. What's your radius of impact? So the best answer I had, well, I have an apartment. I go to the university clinic. If I'm not in the university clinic, I go to the Max Planck Institute or the, the scanning uh, facility as I was doing lots of functional um, magnetic resonance um, imagery at the time. So yes, it's, I don't know, maybe two kilometers, three. So I, I, I think I gave her a, a numerical answer to more of a metaphoric question in any case. My radius was small, right? And then she asked something else. She said, okay, wow, so that's the radius of your of your impact. And, and tell me how many people in the world do still understand uh, what it is you're doing your research on? And then my answer, and is this number getting bigger or smaller over the years? <laughs> I was like, hmm. <laughs> so yes, it might, you know, it, yes, of course, you become somewhat specialized. You uh, you can share your findings with um, others who do their research, but of course, there is a narrowing of the field. And, and then I just said, well, what about actually 
talking to the ministers of health to design whole health system strategies, speaking mm -hmm. to the CEO of hospitals to redesign the way that clinical service is being delivered and wards. What about talking to the leaders in decision-making processes and actually help those insights you have be deployed in real company? Blah, 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 blah. So that actually brought me then, and it did one thing, it, it really lightened up the way that I thought about life even and about what I could become and what I could be doing. And, and with this in mind, so with this, um, yeah, radius of impact in mind and the broadening of those that, um, I can speak to about what I'm doing, uh, I joined, I joined consulting. So I joined you McKinsey. Haven't so you haven't planned it all out when you were uh, starting with your studies or finished? <laughs> oh, by, by far. No, 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 no. I would even say right now I haven't planned out my life um, uh, fully. But there I had no, 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 no. It was even, you see, when you when you study um, a medicine, it's almost like, um, well, they're, they're the good people. Those are the ones that study medicine and stick to the true nature of curing patients. And then there are the other ones who might go to, I don't know, private businesses, etc. cetera. So um, not only did I not consider also my... Um, impression of what it would mm -hmm. be like was very different from what it is today um great Let, let's um get back to the um diversity um topic um as we've already said mckinsey studies consistently show that diverse teams perform better and companies with diverse executive boards have better financial um, results mm -hmm. have you observed this while working your clients or internally at mckinsey Ah, oh, very, very interesting one. Yes, yes. So at, at all times, I observe that teams that have a diversity of thought, either be it because they're mixed gender or they have different ethnicities in their different cultural background, educational background, etc., come up um, with, with, with more, I'd say, innovative, but also more um, objective thoughts and and decisions so this is something i i see day to day and i'm sure my, my colleagues could attest to as well it's not always people might say it's not always the the smoothest process because of course if you think like a and your uh teammate thinks like b and then you have to find out what's the better better result is so there, there's always being there's some some little friction in in intellectual friction in, in figuring out what is right but the result is 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 better and i i deeply enjoy this um, meeting of great minds when they come together and the output is a solution that's so much more convincing than what um simply a, a julia cloned 10 times could have um could have come could have come up with And um, following up on that, has there been a time in your career where you had to overcome a challenge that was a result of diversity? Um, and wh what lessons um, did you learn from that? Yeah, multiple multiple times and um, different in their, I'd say, implicity or explicitness. So mm -hmm. um, one thing I remember well is uh, you mentioned already I spent significant time in the um, in the Middle East. So after I had started working in, in, in Germany and mainly consulted in the health system services field um, around hospitals, etc., there was an ask in the Middle East if I could bring this um, expertise of mine also to some healthcare providers there. So I was supposed to stay for three months for one study. I returned after, I think, 11 years. So <laughs> there has been a quite bit um, longer than expected. a bit, a bit longer than, um, a bit longer than ex expected. And I first, um, uh, yes. And, and, um, what I, what I realized, and this goes, um, this goes both ways in terms of challenges, but also in terms of, um, ad advantages that you can, um, have when you are, uh, somehow, I don't know. Um, diverse, diverse as a, as a profile. I remember well in the first country I worked in, we had a female, um, health minister who was a fantastic leader at the time with a very bold vision on how the health system should advance in her country. Mm -hmm. And I'd say it's been a great advantage for, for me to, to also be a female leader in healthcare, et cetera, to connect, to connect with her and to, to build this, this, this rapport that we were having over, uh, over the month and, um, And years, so that that has been um, helpful. 
when I oh the same happened to me when I then went to um, East Africa for for half a year. I also had a female CEO there of the university um, hospital, also surrounded by a completely male team. And again, and I think gender gender frankly even um, even helped helped me a bit. Where it didn't help is when I first um, for the first time entered Saudi. Uh, Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and um, I think they are also the firm was thinking hmm, what can we do with her because this is now 10 whatever longer more than a decade um, back and things were still very different so I, I happened to be like the first mm -hmm. woman to ever enter this very ministry or the first woman to ever speak to this to this very um, uh, government figure or a uh, private sector figure etc um, so 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 there there I felt I had to work extra hard to make a point that I have the right to be there and have the right to to stay. Again, once you though have established your reputation, mm -hmm. you being somewhat different actually has a remarkable, memorable <laughs> effect. So people more easily know you, know about you, want to continue conversations with you. Um, yeah, but it took um, it took more hard work, I'd say, than um, mm -hmm. it would have taken if I wasn't been if I wouldn't have been that diverse. I would love to listen to more um, of your uh, personal experiences and stories. Um, but I know that there is another topic uh, beside nudging that we haven't talked about yet, which is uh, called bias. Mm. And uh, bias was also a main topic of your studies and is still a present topic um, today also in your um, career. Could you explain what, what bias means and how we can... Um, or should tackle it head on do i have to be afraid of it and <laughs> no, you should be aware of it so 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 uh, no 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 you should be if you start being aware of it there's already um, a big step a big step taken so basically uh, bias exists and it exists for a good reason because it helps us survive it helps us literally create patterns identify stories quickly And therefore also identify danger around us very quickly. So it helps us literally get through life on a day-to-day -day basis um, without having to have our attention everywhere at any point in, in time. So very concretely, you have to think that at any point in time, about 11 million bits of information hit your brain and it can roughly consciously process about 70 of them, 50 of them. So you go down from 11 million bits to 70 with this big filtering exercise. Of course, the brain makes mistakes. That's, that's normal. There are errors in there. And, um, yes, and those errors are, um, are bias. Where it becomes a bit more tricky is that when you're unaware of these, um, of these bias and research shows that those that are believing the most that they are actually objectives might be prone to the most biases. So that's why I was glad, Philip, that you already, um, asked the question of, um, should you be, should you be afraid, um, afraid of it? Yes. I mean, you should be afraid of it in the sense that if you want to build a team, that has um, a lot of uh, diversity, fresh ideas, innovation, etc. in it. And um, what you do is you tend to recruit uh, little Phillips over and over again because you think, hey, you have been successful in your own in your own way. So um, um, a mini version of you will do the same. So yes, indeed, it can be it can be dangerous because again, uh, we we like what rem reminds of of ourselves, and that's a mini me bias. We tend to replicate our own leadership style over and over again, and it's the same. I'm, I'm I realize I'm doing the, the the same. So if I don't watch out for it. Uh, you suddenly see um, many uh, Julias, male or female, around um, <laughs> around in my in my team room because there's a certain type of uh, people that I enjoy mentoring, that I enjoy sponsoring. Um, and, and before coming to other sets of biases, that's maybe the one single most important point why these structured sponsorship programs are so essential. Because mm -hmm. if you do not help people find their sponsor. What will happen is like a marketplace of buyers. Yeah, those sponsors will pick those people whose company that they enjoy. And very often they enjoy the company of those that remind them of themselves. And suddenly you then have sponsors raising the same little versions of them over and over again. Yeah, there, there are other... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, um, that's uh, very interesting. Um, I would like to go one step further because we have a lot of listeners um, who also um, are... Um, 
uh, in uh, recruiting processes and also yeah. want to get uh, some hands-on tips. Do you have any food for thought uh, for groups um, that, or, or tips for um, women or minority groups that could help them in their career advancement? Uh, number number one is um, be aware that um, you might be biased and people around you um, are, and not in a negative way with a negative intent. It's just the way that um, that our brain works. One thing I find remarkable, and that's something you should be aware of, is that you can also have biases <laughs> against yourself. So basically, depending on what you get reminded or choose mm -hmm. <laughs> choose to remind yourself before an interview can actually influence the outcome of your of your performance. So maybe as a as a tip um, right before an interview, now rather than thinking of all the reasons why you shouldn't be here and why they we might have made a hiring hiring mistake already by having you in the room, just think of no what is it what is my natural strength? What what is it that I can uniquely bring to this to this very place? What is it that I am proud of? And this kind of positive framing will will help mm -hmm. you then also be at your the best version of yourself in the in the interview so um thank you for that um uh, I'll, i'll take from that that i don't have to be afraid of it um but i should be aware of it exactly um, julia now comes a new section in our podcast which i would like to introduce now for the first time in mckinsey recruiting it's called ask me anything AMA. <laughs> we want on the virtual streets with our podcast, uh, in this case to our virtual Next Generation Women Leaders event, um, where you also had a speaker slot and asked some participants um, what they want to know about McKinsey. Um, so we've asked them that and I would love to introduce you to those. So uh, are you ready for your free Ask Me Anything questions? Let's go. Great. So uh, the first question comes from Leticia. She studies in Holland and has a follow-up question on your keynote. Hi, Julia. This is Leticia from Holland. During the Next Generation Women Leaders event, you mentioned the CV experiment where Heidi and Howard were evaluated differently, even though they had the exact same qualifications. I wanted to ask you how you have dealt with situations where your leadership skills were not valued because you're exhibiting them as a woman when they would have been appreciated if you were a man. Do you have any specific tips for us on how to find the balance between being assertive but not being seen as bossy? Thank you, Leticia, for the question. Um, maybe first of all, what was this experiment um, all about? And do you have any tips for her? Yeah, yeah she's a, a wonderful question. And um, she's referring back to a double bind um, situation, which is the following, that when um, women tend to act in line with their stereotype, so when they are nice and friendly, polite, rather ask questions, speak with a soft voice, etc., they tend to be liked more at least in experiments and, and studies. Mm -hmm. When they do the exact opposite, though, they're not liked so much. However, if you are not assertive, if you do not speak up, if you're not taking the first uh, air, air space in the, in the, in the room, um, you will more likely also have a less chance to be seen as a leader. So this kind and polite and friendly person is a great colleague, but the moment that people ask, and is she's going to be your future boss, the answer is going to be rather a bit silent. And this very experiment reflects mm -hmm. this. So they took two CVs, one of a man, one of the woman. Otherwise, they went identical. So literally just changed the, the name of the applicant, applicant and then um, asked students if they would like to work with a person. And the same CV was called Howard CV received oh yes mm -hmm. he knows what he wants he's bold he's decisive I want to follow him and the female CV which was um, Heidi's CV again identical just a different name on top is when being asked would you follow this this woman the feedback was more nuanced saying maybe um, maybe she's a bit too focused on herself and her own career progression etc so same CV different gender names yielded a completely different response with regards mm -hmm. to the willingness of people to follow. Now, um, have I have I experienced this? Yes, I think people are harsher in their feedback towards me when I become assertive and bolder in making my points. That's something that I've, um, I have realized, but that did not stop me from making them. I think the, the, the recipe here is to find your own leadership style, some sort of very centered way of leading, and then going with it 
if irrespective if it means that you're assertive if it means that you're loud well that you're loud well that's then you the one thing you shouldn't do is you should not try to pretend to be someone else or try to be nice when you aren't or try to be assertive when you actually wanted to ask a question because this non-authenticity is something that will shine through so um a rather long answer to your to your question so yes of course i i, I have experienced this and i'm sure Many, many people, many leaders um, have. And my recipe towards it is that I just became very centered in the way that who I am and how I lead, um, that these reactions can actually not throw me off track. Okay. So, Leticia, I hope that has answered your question. Um, the second question uh, of our Ask Me Anything comes from Sheetal. She studies uh, business in France. Hi, I'm Sheetal from France. I'm currently a business student and I want to know how the resumes are screened at McKinsey. Is each re resume personally uh, screened by a recruiter or is there an ATS system? Classic recruiting question. Um, how are our recruiting wo uh, recruiters working? Is McKinsey looking at every CV? Yeah, yes. So CVs are being looked at one by one individually. Of course, we are also increasingly um, using technology in our recruiting process. One one example is um, we've designed a, a digital game for our participants, which tests uh, problem solving in a non business in a non business uh, environment. So we can also identify the the talent that has the great intrinsics, but might not be as close to business yet as some other candidates. Okay. Um Thank you for your answer. Uh, Sheetal, I hope that has answered your question. And our third question comes from Ayomi. She uh, has a background as medical student uh, in London. Hello, my name is Ayomi Dayorinde and I'm a medical student from Imperial College in London. My question is this, how should students who don't have conventional internships or work experience approach the McKinsey application process and how do they leverage themselves for these opportunities? Thank you. So interesting question. Is McKinsey looking at experience differently when someone doesn't have experience in consulting or it doesn't come from a business uh, school background, for instance, as a medical student like Iomi? Yeah, or, or like I was at the at the time. So a, a great, great question again. When we, when we look at our candidates, we, we look at what has been, you know, their very personal impact. What's their their entrepreneurial drive, yeah. What, where have they really gone for an opportunity, created something, achieved something? And do we see any early signs or mature signs of, of leadership already? And that's something that you can show no matter what it is that you've, um, that you've studied. So when, when you then ask me about how should I best prepare for the, for the McKinsey interviews, I'm a bit torn. I have to tell you, I myself as a medical student, I, I think I, I read every single business case that was ever written in the, in the, in, in the world just to make sure I understood the logic and how to go about it. It, it might have been a waste of my time, it, but it gave me a certain, I don't know, it, it gave me a, a certain confidence walking into the interview process that I would not get surprised by, by a business question. Did it help in any way the, the outcome other than that? I don't, I don't think so. Because as I said, those, those markers that we look for in, in our candidates, they can be shown in so many different ways and, and forms that have nothing to do with a business environment. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, answering also the third question. I hope also that um, this uh, answer um, that you uh, feel answered. Uh, I uh, want to have the right to have uh, the last question of our interview. Um, now we've heard our free Ask Me Anything questions. Um, uh, and uh, if you know the classic McKinsey technique of top-down communication, mm -hmm. um, where you sum up the key message of what you want to say, preferably, of course, at the beginning of a presentation, this should be no problem for you, Julia. The question is, what is it that you would like our listeners to get out of our podcast episode today? Continue to be this very unique person profile that you are and don't try to adapt any other leadership style features etc just because the world around you might show some some bias so stay unique and stay centered and on the road towards your to, fi to finding your own leadership profile 
Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we have reached the end of uh, today's recruiting podcast episode. Thank you, Julia, for uh, this deep dive into diversity. It was a pleasure to get to know you further and introduce you to our listeners. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you have more questions or ideas for our show, drop us a line on our podcast page, mckinsey.com slash recruiting podcast. To learn more about our diversity recruiting efforts, how to apply and tons of other information, check out mckinsey.com slash careers. Thank you.